One of the things that I do when I talk to customers about their cloud network designs is try and really focus on the, the flows to make it come to life. So we talk about maybe VNet to VNet in the same region, VNet to VNet cross region, two from the internet, two from remote users, maybe racked on premises, maybe two remote untrusted third parties. Well, increasingly in those conversations, we also talk about how do I get two from another cloud provider? whether it be from my Azure VNet to a remote VPC or from my Azure public IP address to a public IP in another cloud provider. So in this session, I'm going to introduce the high level concepts that I use to break that down from multi-cloud all up into the high level concepts of multi-cloud networking. And then we'll take a look at some possible solutions to the various flows and then we'll bring it to life with some real world customer solutions. So the agenda for the next 30 to 45 minutes looks roughly like this. We'll introduce this idea of thinking about the drivers for multi-cloud within an organization first before diving into the networking solutions. And I'll introduce my own perspective of how to talk to your CSP about that. Of course, the, the single CSP employee or vendor is particularly biased in this because that's only part of the puzzle. And then we'll break it down into two high level categories of different multi-cloud networking. We'll cover the public side. So that's a public IP talking to a public IP. And we'll talk about the idea of what is the internet and the backbone connectivity between companies. And then we'll dive into private multi-cloud networking. And this may be what you're thinking about Initially, if you hear this scenario of multi-cloud networking, you might be thinking, how do I get my private IPs in a VNet, talking to my private IPs in a VPC, in a different CSP, and then we'll split that into three subcategories to try and drive home the, the possible options here. And then we'll bring it to life, and I'll, I'll talk about three customers I've worked with in a generic way, uh, how they had different requirements, how those requirements drove the solution, and what that solution look like. Okay, so I think this is a really important point to capture and sometimes it does get missed, which is before you dive straight into the the solutioning of the network or the multi-cloud, it's good to understand why you as a, a company are actually looking at using multiple cloud providers in the first place because there are many scenarios for this and the why you went multi-cloud could ultimately feed into the solution uh, at a technical level. Before we even do that though, I think we should agree on the terminology of multi-cloud because depending on who you are, your background, who you work for, multi-cloud can mean different things to um, many different people. And it really sort of highlights the, the limit of the word itself. It's only got a certain amount of fidelity. So just to be clear in, in the context of this video, I'm talking about multi-cloud as you're using multiple cloud providers uh, in the public cloud. So maybe you're an Azure customer and you're also consuming services from AWS or from GCP or Oracle. That's what I'm defining as multi, I say public cloud networking. What I'm not talking about is connecting my on-premises private cloud to the public cloud. We would typically call that a hybrid cloud scenario. I'm not talking about using multiple cloud services at a high level category from the same CSP. So in Microsoft, we have Azure, we have M365, we have the, the, the Power Platform. And generally we refer to that as the Microsoft Cloud, the all up use of the various Microsoft Clouds. So I'm very much focused on public CSP to public CSP. And I'm not talking about connectivity to other SaaS providers, let's say Salesforce, et cetera. I'm not even sure if, you, if we've agreed on a terminology for how you connect on-prem to a SaaS provider. I think that's just basically referred to as using SaaS. When we think about why a company has gone multi-cloud, there's a few high-level categories we can break the rationale down into. The first one, the green box here, this is more intentional. This is maybe a newer organization, and they've had the luxury of defining a multi-cloud strategy for Greenfield, or it's a, an older organization that's trying to wrangle with existing use 
uh, and define a strategy for using multiple clouds. Some examples of why you might do this. Number one, regulation. So maybe you're working within a vertical that has regulatory framework that says you must consume public cloud services from multiple vendors. Number two is you're doing it for business continuity slash disaster recovery. So you're, you're sort of saying, okay, I want to mitigate the risk of this CSP going offline in its entirety or disappearing for a period of time. And I want to be able to either flip over to a different CSP for active active workloads. Or I want to be able to maybe reinflate workloads over a longer time, a protracted period of time with a greater RTO into that other CSP. Number three is this idea of, um, let's say the, the, the reach. So maybe you're, a, a, you're building SaaS services on top of the public cloud. Maybe you, you are offering you know, ISV services to other customers who exist on those clouds. So maybe you have to build your service close to your customers your customers exist on multiple clouds. You need to build across all of the, the various um, public cloud bases to, make, to, to ensure you meet your, your sub-customers where they are. And maybe a slight derivative of that could be maybe there are some parts of the world where um, Microsoft or AWS or Google have better local coverage of clouds to serve that market. So that's maybe the, the geographical angle to that. And then there's a, a fourth category here, which is a bit harder to define. It's kind of a catch-all bucket of you've gone multi-cloud because you want to maybe get the best price. You know, maybe if you if you want to consume a generic service, you, you might want to pick the best price at the uh, particular time from all the vendors. You want to avoid locking perhaps for particular services across those uh, various CSPs. That's a, another possible reason for intentional use. Of multiple clouds. The yellow bucket here, this is probably one that I see more to be honest. And this is, well, it just happened. You know, organic growth. We started using the public cloud seven, 10 years ago. And oh, here we are today. We are using services from multiple CSPs. Uh, and why could that be? Well, not always is it the case that uh, central IT controls everything inside of an organization. Maybe you have sub teams just doing their own thing. They're trying to get um, their product to market. They're just trying to grind through the development cycle. So they've spun up something in AWS or Google just to get something done and, and they've bypassed IT. So sometimes we refer to that as shadow IT. The second one, and this is really common, that is you get organizations that are just so large where each line of business almost is its own IT team in, in a sense, and they're quite disconnected. Uh, maybe there's not a central cloud center of excellence governing everything, or that, that, that CCOE is trying to wrangle with the, the various lines of business driving their own IT decisions. So you might have, for example, uh, the SAP team, have got a history of working with Microsoft, they move SAP to Azure. Maybe you've got this other team within the organization who's uh, come from uh, a different background and they've already adopted a service on AWS from a long time ago. And this is just sort of inherent in the organization. And this is um, just happened over a period of time, not, not through any sort of uh, deterministic strategy. Number three is mergers and acquisitions. So this is, you know, you've got a big company who were perhaps already set on a single cloud. They've bought another sub-company who was set on a different cloud provider. And, oh, what do you know? Now you're a multi-cloud uh, company. What do you do? Do you, um, do you reconcile down to one provider? Do you try and integrate across multiple providers? Uh, that's certainly uh, a scenario that I've seen many times. And let's not forget that, um, yes, we're talking about multi-cloud here. But, of course, one strategy, which is kind of the antithesis to multi-cloud, would be Nope, I'm not going to do multi-cloud. I'm going to stick with a single CSP. So I'm just going to use Azure or just AWS. And I'm going to learn the, the systems from that CSP in as much detail as possible. I'm going to focus all of my engineering effort and all of my 
um, learning on that one CSP. I'm going to go big with that CSP. I'm going to go as fast as I can to drive my digital innovation as fast as I can. And again, that's that's a very, very common strategy as well. And I've seen that work well for lots of customers. Of course, there's trade-offs here, right? Um, it's um, you, you go fast, but you have to accept you're working with a single company and all of the downstream consequences of that. But that's beyond the scope of this video. So let's think about some examples of um, how this might manifest itself. So as I said, the most common one that I've seen is it just happened. Various um, parts of the business adopted services from different vendors at different times. What might that look like? Well, here we've got um, a customer who's deployed their HR app, the SAP on, on Azure. They've got some web stuff happening on Amazon and um, maybe they're hearing murmurings of a team using something on Google. This is a, a story that's applicable to a lot of um, uh, enterprise customers. The mergers and acquisitions, how might that look? You, uh, as a customer, are running on top of Azure. You've got your SAP, HR, web, data, all of this uh, various lines of business consolidated into one cloud. And oh, you've acquired a company who were doing that on AWS. Now you need to think your way through that. A third example here of a company that's gone, oh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna move into the public cloud and for regulation purposes, I need to deploy to multiple cloud providers and I want to have this ability to flip between the various CSPs very seamlessly. Example here is uh, a company that's running a trading platform where they build out the exact same copy of their application. Very often this will use a, a level of um, flattening for the infrastructure layer. So you, you see uh, Kubernetes as the, the flattening layer here, very, very common to sort of um, standardize on the, the infrastructure APIs. And then the fourth example would be the, the what if scenario. This is where you've got maybe more active standby workloads between clouds. So you maybe under normal conditions, you run your uh, SAP and your HR app on Azure, but you only back up the data to a different CSP. Maybe you run your web application active active across clouds because it's very easy to sort of synchronize the data on the back end and use services like Front Door or Akamai or Cloudflare on the front end. Maybe you run your data workload in AWS, but you only reflate it in, in Azure in an absolute catastrophic event. So it, you know, for one of these boxes, the, the blue box or the orange box to go offline, that's a, a fairly catastrophic event. And you know, we haven't seen that yet in public cloud. We haven't seen single CSP completely disappear for a period of time. Yes, across the various companies, you see loss of availability zones, loss of services, loss of regions, but we haven't seen a protracted loss of a single CSP for a long period of time. That would certainly be a, a seismic shock in the industry, um, which hasn't happened, hopefully will never happen. But if you're a large enough organization, you're important enough, you're a government, you're a huge multinational bank, you want to, you will certainly have a strategy to offset the risk of that thing happening. But why does this all matter for networking? Well, the point here is the reason why you've gone multi-cloud is driving the various inputs into your networking solution. So for example, if you are running kind of, uh, the, the warm standby to a different CSP, maybe you need less bandwidth between the various cloud providers. If you are using the various CSPs for regulation because you want you wanted to mitigate the risk of one of those CSPs going down, well, maybe you don't want to standardize on a another common layer in the middle. Um, if you're using, as I said, the most common approach that I've seen the line of business driving the use of CSPs and you've just got these big buckets of various apps everywhere, maybe you, what you need is a, a substrate between the CSPs that is very much like an MPLS network. Maybe you need you know, very high bandwidth, very high um, level of assurance at the network level, but maybe that would drive certain solutions as we'll see later. And the final point I want to make in this sort of introduction before we get into the networking angle 
is just uh, from a customer side, just remember who, who you're talking to. So, I mean, I'm presenting this as a Microsoft um, employee. I'm sharing my experiences of, of talking to customers and having worked uh, for various networking vendors and being a customer myself. Ultimately, if, if you're a enterprise customer and you are consuming services from multiple CSPs and you've decided to do that for either uh, explicit reasons or it's just happened, you are ultimately responsible for your overall success as an IT organization when using those multiple CSPs. So you can't, um, even though I can share my experience, ultimately as Microsoft, I'm only solving for the blue box here. You would never talk to Microsoft about, you know, give me the specific strategy for multi-cloud networking because we, we don't hold all of the, the jigsaw pieces here. Um, so ultimately, someone in, inside of the customer organization has to take responsibility for this. Yes, you might get advice from a CSP um, about their services and how to integrate that into the overall strategy. What I also want to highlight is at that point, you may be then talking to non-CSP vendors. So maybe you're talking to someone uh, like VMware who's sort of cloud agnostic or uh, traditional networking vendor like Cisco, or maybe you're talking to Arista or um, any any SD WAN vendor, etc. And a combination of you and getting advice from non CSP vendors is what will overall result in the the overall strategy here for your multi cloud network. Um, so hopefully that gives you a flavour for the, the different roles and responsibilities. Okay, let's dive into the networking aspect of multi-cloud now and i want to introduce a high level concept which is going to steer the rest of the conversation which is you very quickly arrive at this this high level delineation of i've got something on azure i've got something on a different cloud provider i'm going to use aws uh, this is the most common scenario amazon and azure are the two biggest csp so this will be the most common multi-cloud scenario uh, it's very good to probe into this at, at, as the first question. What do you mean by the question marks in this diagram? What do you mean by something in Azure talking to something in AWS? And very quickly you get to, oh, I mean, it's a private IP in my VNet talking to a private IP in my VPC. Okay, I classify that as private multi-cloud networking. Maybe you mean I've got a public IP on maybe like an API endpoint in Azure, on a storage account in Azure, or an app service in Azure, and I need to talk to a public IP of a service that I'm building on AWS. Okay, I'm going to refer to that as public multi-cloud networking. And these two high-level categories have very different solutions, are very different models to, to be used when thinking about them. As I say here, slight caveat, the streams can cross a little bit. We can use the public side as an underlay for the private networking, but I'll come on to that uh, later in the video. Let's talk about the public side first, because that's a bit easier to think about and uh, solution for. As I said, this is a, a, we're talking about a PIP on Azure. Could be a PIP associated with a VM, a PIP associated with a load balancer in a VNet, or a PIP, a public IP associated to a PaaS service that's ultimately getting returned when you look up a DNS entry for uh, a PaaS service you're using on Azure, talking to the equivalent on AWS. And this sort of pattern is more common with a certain category of customers. So let's just build out this slide. Now, don't, don't take this um, completely as is. This, is. this is me generalizing. This is a low resolution view. There will always be exceptions to the rule. But at a high level, the type of customers that are more interested in public to public networking, I like to think of this as uh, customers who maybe don't think about the network so much. So uh, imagine you have a, a fish in the water and the fish is swimming around. That fish doesn't realize the water exists. So that for a lot of customers who are talking public IP on Azure, the public IP elsewhere, and it's developer-led, etc. We're not really thinking about the network. 
Uh, it's like a fish who's not really thinking about the water. It's just there. And these are generally maybe more cloud native, developer led organizations that are born into the cloud, you know, infrastructure as code, uh, very sort of DevOps centric from the start. And, and for sure, the, the, these customers are, are normally working for companies that have the luxury of getting into IT later. They don't have 25 years of, of baggage behind them. And these customers probably are adopting more complexity at the application level. So all application calls are definitely using uh, TLS encrypted uh, certificate calls. You would probably say this is more aligned with a zero trust model. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think a fair way to agree on zero trust would be to assume that your network is is like the internet always. You know, it, it's always open. Assume the network is always breached. Give very little importance and consequence to using a private IP address. Just see the network as a substrate. Assume the network can uh, 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 sort of get out of the way and the application can uh, accommodate the, the sort of security angle of, of that uh, app to app flow. Generally speaking, very, very high transaction volume, but a relatively low bandwidth. We're talking sort of high volume API calls, not synchronous replication of a, a monolithic database. And as I said, the, a lot of things that are normally pushed down to the network level, like visibility into traffic flow, the resilience of flows is pushed into the application level. And maybe this is the world of service meshes and applications being able to uh, get around things like breaks in, uh, you know, if, a, if a TCP flow is interrupted, well, it'll, it'll restart. So when we actually unpack, we've got a public IP over here, a public IP over here. What do we actually mean by connecting two APIs that are using public IPs, a Microsoft public IP talking to an Amazon public IP, a low resolution view might be, well, is that just the internet? And um, maybe if you, if you have a second phase of one of these organizations, it could be, well, should I be trusting the internet? I mean, I mean, yes, maybe we've never really thought about the fact we're swimming through water, but hang on a minute, what, what if that water was to become unreliable? Um, how much can we can we trust it? Well, that's generally where you can step down to a next level of detail and start thinking about what does it actually mean to connect a PIP from Microsoft to a PIP on AWS? What is the internet between companies of this size? And what I want to sort of communicate here is well, when when actually you unpack this behind the scenes. You connect an Azure region to the Azure backbone. You connect an AWS region to the AWS backbone. Big companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, we are going to have uh, our routers connected back to back. And you know, if, if you look in the right places on the internet, you will find uh, all the evidence you need of this uh, because it's you know it's mutually beneficial, right? If if we're sending a high, de high degree, a high portion of what, what people think of as the internet traffic these days, because so much has moved to public cloud, is actually public cloud to public cloud communication. Imagine you've got all traffic from Office 365 going to AWS. Well, we want to make that as reliable and as cost efficient as possible. So it's in everyone's interest, including Microsoft and Amazon, to have dedicated links. So we'll have you know, very big, juicy, quite often um, 100 gigabits per second and beyond pipes back to back between Microsoft routers, Amazon routers, and we will run those links. Um, so when, when you think about the internet, it's actually probably just a cable going between a Microsoft router and an Amazon internet for a, a PIP to PIP flow in this example. There'll be multiple uh, of these edge sites around the world. I mean, Microsoft have... Uh, hundreds of ed sites go to Amazon and we, we connect to Amazon and all the other tens of thousands of, of uh, companies around the world in this way. An example might be in Europe. I mean, this is not, uh, this is not the exact topology in Europe. This is representative. So please don't take this uh, as, as a suggestion of, of the actual network, but 
as an example, we would have these things called PNIs. So these links are uh, referred to as PNIs in, in the industry, private network interconnects. We're going to have them in multiple locations, like we'll have them in London, we'll have them in Amsterdam, and then perhaps we'll have uh, what's referred to as Internet Exchange, uh, IX. So there's places like uh, Lynx and Lonap, and there's peer and exchanges in other countries around the world where rather than having dedicated connectivity between companies, you all get together in a, a common place. So there's, there's areas in countries where there'll be many, many organizations already having equipment. For example, uh, in London, uh, the Lynx Internet Exchange will operate a, a service where everyone connects the Lynx. Uh, and they will stitch together all the various periods across their infrastructure. So that there's an element of the IX's infrastructure between the two companies. And then if all of that was to fail, there's the general concept of transit or that's kind of how the internet is built in a lot of cases where you know, to go from this company over here to this company over here, you use one of the companies that are purely in the business of... Um, providing backbone transit. Okay, so that was the story of public to public networking, not talked about any sort of private IPs at all. Now let's get into the more nuanced and complicated world of private to private multi-cloud networking. And it's fair to say that if you were to look on LinkedIn or YouTube or Twitter or any of the common network analyst sites of today, multi-cloud networking is probably being viewed through the lens of, of private to private. That's where we've got you know, private IP on the VNet on the left, private IP on the VPC on the right. How do we get them talking to each other? And again, we can make some high level, uh, sort of broad brush hand waving statements about these sort of uh, organizations that would be interested in this, this scenario. And these would be your sort of more mature enterprise customers. And this is IT have got a very strong hold on, on what it looks like. These are the companies where you, you're exiting a data center on-prem. There was a central firewall there. You had to control all traffic through maybe IPS, IDS. Um, for a period of time, there'll be a lot of hybrid scenario. Even, even when moving the central gravity to public cloud, there'll be a very high degree of uh, chatter back to on-prem. We place a lot of importance on the identity of a private IP address. So this concept of being inside of my network versus being outside, outside of my network is very intrinsic to the security conversations, um, either due to inertia thinking or regulation, not allowing use of public IPs, or just due to the simple fact that when you're inside of your private IP bubble, you'll quite often have a, have a implied level of separation to the public internet and other untrusted third parties. Often you'll find that there's higher levels of bandwidth. So each flow perhaps is less uh, lower um, throughput API calls, but maybe a, a longer running, long lived TCP stream transferring large amounts of data due to the way in which the applications chunk that up over a period of time. Maybe the company's on a journey to use microservices, but still still using um, you know, 20 year old applications. And all of this nets up to more, more reliance on the network. So more business risk is being mitigated down at the network level. So I want to address my ability to scale by having bigger network links, my ability to adopt uh, resilience of network paths by having more network links, links that I've paid to get certain SLAs on uh, I've paid to get private network links because maybe my application is still sending clear text data or I have scenarios where I'm not using TLS, uh, X, Y, Z. But this is, this is giving you the flavor of how these companies might differ to more born in the cloud, the, the green companies I was presenting earlier. So this is the focus of this section. We're going to get into what does that red circle look like? What are my options for connecting private IPs between the various cloud providers. And I'm going to break this down into three subcategories. So inside of private networking, we'll talk about having basic IPsec VPNs. We'll talk about what I will call private interconnects, the various ways we can 
use those. And then we'll talk about overlay network solutions. Let's cover the most straightforward one first. This is a pattern that's sort of sprinkled in the industry, but it's normally used just to get yourself out of a hole. And that is, I've got something over there on AWS. I've got something here on Azure. How do I connect uh, these islands together using native services like a VPN gateway in Azure, talking to a transit gateway in AWS? Uh, how could I do that using a VPN over the internet? Well, the story here now really is this is possible using native components. You don't have to deploy network virtual appliances to make this happen. And uh, the general reason for that is um, the various CSPs have, have ways of interoperating with BGP now. For example, Azure supports these APIP arrangers, the, the 169.254 rangers for tunnel setup, which is a mandatory requirement in AWS. I'll leave some links down here. I'll copy these into the, the comments, but Jose Marino has got a great blog here. Uh, it's probably the pick of the links where he talks through the technical details of, of configuring connectivity between Google, AWS, Microsoft, resilient IPsec tunnels, and the, and the importance of the introduction of these APIP arrangers. The next category, which is more common in enterprise, and this is this scenario where I've got my use of Azure. Maybe I've got an express route circuit, like a 10 gig circuit or resilient 10 gig circuits that take me back to on-premises. Maybe they come back all the way to my data center or more likely they go into a cloud network edge site, you know, like some colo facility where I'm terminating my express route circuits near to the various CSPs. And I've adopted the same pattern with AWS. I've got some direct connect circuits that come into the same infrastructure. And really what we're talking about here is how do I stitch together my private interconnect from Microsoft, aka Express Route, to my private interconnect from AWS, aka Direct Connect? What does that routing function look like in the middle? What are my options there? The first way you could do that would be use your own routers. It's very common for customers to have built out maybe what Gartner would refer to as the performance hub, sometimes referred to as cloud network edges uh, or CNXs, where you've built out maybe like a quarter rack or a half rack in like an Equinix facility close to geographically the cloud providers. You've got resilient routers and they terminate the BGP well, just as you switch from cloud to on-prem, you could switch from cloud to cloud. You could be the, the, the IP forwarding function in the middle there. And this assumes you've, you've built out the relevant edge colo. You've invested the, the CapEx in that equipment to, to do that function. Normally these customers that do this have large in-house network teams um, who know BGP, are very familiar with those concepts of managing a global wide area network. Or you might have outsourced this. So for example, uh, here in the UK, the companies like BT, for example, who manage customer networks will manage your cloud edge for you if you uh, contract out that portion of your network. And it's very uh, often the case that it's the network team. So the, the, the on-premises network team that's maybe doing a bit of cloud is managing this function. And that can create a bit of tension. Uh, and that is what you're effectively doing here is you're inserting the on-prem network team between your various use of cloud. So if you're trying to go really fast in Azure, really fast in AWS, and you've got a dependency on the network team, well, you better make sure that network team's along for the ride. You don't want to get into this story of, oh, I need a four week ticket on the network team. Oh, that's a six month project to build out of this firewall. That's really gonna kill your your sort of the, the cloud dream in your organization. It's very common to see these uh, patterns adopted with encrypted private network links as well. So for example, on the express route side, if this was express route direct, we could run MaxSec over that and that would give you an, an additional level of, of uh, let's say security risk mitigation at the network level, uh, if you don't have that at the application level. What I would say is, um, these designs can get very complicated very, very quickly. And they're just as complicated as managing a global MPLS network. 
because fundamentally what you're doing is you're taking multiple virtual data centers in the various cloud providers, normally in various time zones around the world, and stitching them together. You very quickly get into failure scenarios, BGP route optimization, and this is an example uh, sort of diagram of a, a possible customer network where uh, it's very common for customers to have time zones in Europe, US, Asia, stitch it all together. Well, you, you, you sort of, we need to understand that that is not a trivial thing. You, we, when you move to cloud, you might think there's a silver bullet and networking goes away. Well, if you adopt this private interconnect model that you maintain, your network team is, is more important than ever um, because this, this level of complexity uh, is hopefully being conveyed here by the diagram is, is still very much present. The next option would be, well, what if I don't want to use my routers? I don't want to make that CapEx investment. Could I ask the same people that terminate my express route for me and my direct connect, maybe someone like Equinix um, or Megaport, could they provide the glue in the middle? Could they stitch my private network interconnect together? Um, and the answer is yes. There's um, many customers uh, who adopt services like this and they're becoming increasingly popular. And this is um, for several reasons. I mean, it's more of an OPEX investment. You, you pay for that virtual edge router function like you pay for the cloud. Uh, and that's quite attractive if you're bought into the, the cloud model all up. Also, because it's a virtual function, uh, it's sort of a, a double-edged sword here. It's a virtual function, so it can scale out easier. You don't have to buy more tin. You just throw more CPU at it effectively from, from that virtual edge provider's um, blob of, of private cloud. So you, you can potentially scale up better uh, or faster, at least. But then we also have to watch out for the limits of those virtual CPE functions. So just like when you scale network virtual appliances in the cloud, you have to watch out for the, the intrinsic fundamental limits of running network through generalized x86 and get into, um, well, what does it look like for big TCP flows? Uh, is there scaling timeframes? You know, what are the scaling algorithms? So definitely press on that uh, if you go down this angle. Some examples of, of people in this space, Equinix offer this function as a sort of network edge sitting on top of ECX. Megaport have their Megaport cloud router, uh, which is quite popular, certainly in uh, Europe and EMEA. And I noticed, uh, here's an example from uh, DKIX, who are a, a large German operator. It looks like uh, last month or early this year, they announced this same function. So we've got this cloud router as an example of a, a company that's previously been in the game of operating and selling, hey, buy an express route, hey, buy a, a direct connect. Well, now they can be the, the glue in the middle of, of that story as well. And I think that's a pattern that we'll see continue for sure. Okay, let's look at our third category for private networking. And this is a space which is definitely getting a lot of airtime at the moment. And this is the idea of overlay networking. This is, if I've got something virtual in Azure, something virtual in AWS, the virtual network equipment, or NVAs, if they've got a public IP or a private IP, let's just say that they've got network reachability somehow. I just want to run overlay tunnels across, the, across that. So I'm sort of substrate agnostic. I don't mind if it's the internet or express route or direct connect. The first option within this overlay space, which is sometimes missed, but it's definitely a pattern that I've seen adopted by several customers is if you already have an SD-WAN strategy or story developing inside of your organization, well, let's just acknowledge that that can also be used for multi-cloud. So, just as a quick primer, SD-WAN is this idea of software-defined wide area networking. It's the idea that we can use software uh, advancements to sort of mitigate the possible more unreliable medium of the underlay. So if you've got the internet and it's a bit flaky or, or you've got multiple underlay paths, well, software can choose between the two and monitor them, etc. And um, that's more commonly used for 
hey, I've got fairs in the branches. I want them all to talk to each other. Maybe back to my data center. It's very common for customers now to talk to us about how do I connect my SD-WAN branches into Azure? And that's where you get into the world of running virtual SD-WAN appliances in Azure to enable this sort of cloud to branch flow. Well, what if I just put one of those SD-WAN vendors over there in AWS as well? Well, now, now you've extended your substrate of SD-WAN to run inside of the other cloud. So it just becomes a branch at that point. Um, so you know, if you're working with, I've grabbed this screenshot here from, from one of the Azure docs of companies that integrated with virtual WAN, just to give you a flavor for the, the quantity of vendors out there. Um, and also we can check out, uh, I'll leave this link below. We've got various patterns on how to integrate SD-WAN into Azure. But re really the call out here is to, to say, well, this is an option if you're already going down the SD-WAN route. Let's look at the uh, next category of underlay. And this is probably more in the space of what you may have expected in this video, which is that the developing area of vendors that are focused on connecting multiple clouds together as their primary USP in their business. So we're, we're going after, um, we've got customers in AWS and Azure, and they just wanna connect the clouds together. How do we make that happen in a way which makes it easy for the network team to do that? and maybe sort of abstract away the differences in complexity from Azure APIs, AWS APIs. And this is a, a space where you'll come, ac come across names like this. So uh, I've separated them into three categories within this, this sort of uh, multi-cloud networking vendor space. And the first one would be companies that primarily target CSP to CSP. And this is where you've got companies like Aviatrix, I've grabbed a screenshot here of their solution where effectively you, you put their appliances in the various clouds and they mesh together and you can run sort of very high bandwidth encryption. They've got a sort of a proprietary algorithm for doing line rate IPsec encryption. And where this would differ to an SD-WAN vendor perhaps is because they're focused very much on the CSP, these vendors will often extend a bit further into the CSP integration. So the story doesn't end at the, at the, the NVA. For example, with Aviatrix, you can use their software to configure all the various VNets and VPCs to point traffic at their overlay. So they will handle maybe the UDR configuration, the spinning up of new VNets, et cetera. You, you start building out a more sort of homogenous layer of cloud networking which can go further into the cloud than the, uh, the, the SD-WAN vendors that generally typically assume you will get traffic to them. And there's, there's all sorts of stories here around how you would integrate via uh, BGP with Transit Gateway or Root Server or Virtual WAN, et cetera. And the other players in that uh, space are the likes of uh, Alkira and Prosimo. So check out them if you want to get a, an idea. Here is how it might look. For example, it looks very similar to SD-WAN, but, but it's more focused on not about branches, not about connecting back to on-prem. It's more about how do I connect the overlay from cloud to cloud? And then you have the concept of uh, you know, where, where do you put your controller? Where do you put the brains or the Borg of, uh, of that solution? There is a, another category here which is a bit more loosely defined. And this is more kind of the, the hybrid scenario of buying backbone plus software. Uh, and in this space, you've got companies like Cato, Ariarca, uh, and Graphian. So Graphian's uh, a newer company who I've noticed just got some uh, more, more seed investment. I think this has been built out by the people that um, uh, built one of the SD-WAN company, companies, might have been, might have been Viptela. But the, the idea there is kind of saying, yes, we've got some software, but also we'll provide a um, network as a service like Backbone. So I know Graphian are building out more in the US. That would be, you can consume their, their Backbone substrate physically that they're building out to extend to the cloud with an element of software. 
automation as well. And then there are some other names to be aware of um, just for, for awareness. So uh, Arcus, they're more on the sort of uh, 5G operator side. And then you've got Valtex, who were recently acquired by Cisco. They're coming at this more from a security background. But I think the, the fact that Cisco, who are, of course, the largest incumbent network vendor, have acquired a company like this, it's sort of a signal that... Um, this multi-cloud space is definitely starting to gain more, more traction. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground, but hopefully now you have this framework of being able to approach these discussions in a more structured way. But let's just try and round off by bringing it together. And I will talk about a few real world customer scenarios that I've seen. So number one, this is probably representative of that uh, line of business driving decisions, organic growth. It just happened. Lots of large enterprises are like this. And this customer here, you'll probably end up with a mix. And um, in this diagram, you've got uh, you know, various functions deployed on various clouds. And this customer has gone for the approach of, I'm going to take my express route. I'm going to take my direct connect. I'm going to take my partner interconnect from Google. And I'm gonna bring that back to a CNX, which I've partly outsourced in this example to Megaport. So I'm using the Megaport cloud router, route prefixes from left to right. So my VNet in Azure, when it's talking from a HR app to web app, it just sees the VPC as another on-prem prefix, uh, routes left and right down this pipe that I've paid an element of uh, money here to get dedicated links and in this space you need to watch out for things like um, the number of routes you can advertise left to right etc the bandwidth of this cloud router and this is fairly representative um, of, of a lot of companies normally then you want to start worrying about well how many of these cloud edges do I have where are all those cloud edges place place to ensure the best performance how much latency uh, can I allow for between clouds Generally, what you'll also see is a sprinkling of there is still an element of API, API over the Internet. Maybe you've got uh, this web endpoint exposed on a public IP. Maybe some of the systems in Azure talk to the public endpoint uh, if it's a more sort of um, transactional uh, authenticated, authenticated API call. So it, it's, it's common to have both here and um, being pragmatic about when to use each networking solution I think is important. If you were to very sort of generalize at a very high level, going from this approach here to this approach here would be aligned to this sort of North Star of many customers when they think about uh, going uh, cloud native and um, uh, zero trust and uh, Sort of adopting the the network as a substrate rather than pushing everything down to the network layer second example this is a, a modern retail organization and again they've ended up with things in various clouds maybe through acquisition and they've got thousands of stores they rolled out an sd-wan network these sd-wans overlays were used to connect physical cpe in their on-prem data center their stores they rolled out sd-wan in the clouds and they just used the same sd-wan to get between everywhere so this this for them was a really nice solution they got single pane of glass to get visibility into their network they were able to adopt the orange box very quickly using the incumbent sd-wan some of the the considerations here are well if you've got blue to yellow now flowing via the sd-wan box you're competing for bandwidth on this virtual appliance with flows that go blue to red. So it has to be sized appropriately. And uh, when you talk to your SD-WAN vendor about sizing, you very quickly realize that NVA sizing of SD-WAN is very different to physical CPE sizing of SD-WAN. Another way of saying that would be you know, ASICs can still do a lot of work the physical ASICs versus 
democratized x86 forwarding uh, there's still a story there and that can very much change the, the sizing and shape of an sd-wan solution right the last example and this was our um customer that uh, built out a trading platform so we 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 said they've kind of got uh, one homogenous blob of of code the code is the same in each cloud here and we said we're they're sort of using the cloud providers as a, a utility layer infrastructure uh, with kubernetes this customer they did this for regulation and for uh, resilience they adopted routers that they manage in co-locations uh, points in uh, in london and they connected all of their highly secure financial customers into their network they ran encrypted links here so this was all very much a private network story with very reliable performance going up to a a level of standardized uh, the same code everywhere okay well i hope you found that useful and i hope that allows you to structure your thinking just to summarize what we talked about we, we talked about the importance of thinking about why you're going multi-cloud first before talking about multi-cloud networking we talked about ultimately if you're adopting services from multiple csps then it's it's your challenge to wrangle with so consider um who you're being who you're being influenced by who you are outsourcing your thinking to uh, and ultimately uh, you will be the one uh, uh holding the the basket if things were to go wrong so make sure that uh, you've got the skills in house to think about this and then we talked about the high level categories of, of public networking and private networking when the internet's not really the internet maybe how that represents the more native than all staffer companies we broke the the private networking category into three sub areas of vpn private interconnects and overlay scenarios and then hopefully that last section there of of making it real maybe that might help your own thinking on on your journey one last point i'll leave you with is um you know i do think as a, a company microsoft is quite pragmatic when it comes to multi-cloud and we, we've got many products ourselves uh, like Arc and Defender, which can be used across multiple cloud providers. And uh, we do have some guidance at a high level when it comes to connectivity to other cloud providers, which I'll leave the link to below. This is inside of our uh, cloud adoption framework guidance. All right, well, thanks for watching. Hope you found that useful. Drop any comments and thoughts in the chat below. Happy to do future videos more technical uh, on any of the areas we covered today but I will catch you in the next one.